Hey everyone, I'm Mary Beth McAndrews, and I'm very excited to be here today with Nick Cutter and Andrew F. Sullivan, writers you are all familiar with, but we are here to chat about their new book they co-wrote together, The Handyman Method, which is coming out in August of this year. I am so excited to chat with both of you. How are you? Lovely. Thanks for having us, Mary Beth. Um, so as I told you off air, I devoured this so quickly and it is so nauseating in the best way possible which I am and if you have listeners if you have read either of their books you can expect this but I wanted to hear from the beginning how the two of you came together to write this book and kind of like yeah what why come together and write it together Andrew why don't you cover that hagiography yep sure uh so Craig and I have probably known each other for a decade now but back in the day, I put out a short story collection called All We Want Is Everything. Around the same time, Craig had a novel out under Craig Davidson. And, you know, I was like, hey, man, I think you should read my work. And he ended up, you know, picking up the book. And uh, we kind of went out for drinks, started talking. That's where how the friendship started. But it was probably seven years before we actually... Uh, collaborated at all like it was very much you know we're both writers we respect each other's work we respect what each other do and then Craig came to me and was like hey man do you want to write a short story together I have this idea and I think it would be cool and I was like yeah man that would be amazing let's do it and then uh you know Craig and his wife had a second kid so we put that on the shelf and we didn't talk about writing together for maybe a year it was like all right well that was a nice dream and then, you know, about a year later, Craig was like, all right, let's write this short story. It'll be fun. And that's literally how this started. It was like two friends going to write a short story together, maybe 5,000 words. Oh, 5,000 words. We can do that in two weeks. And then, <laughs> um, you know, we, we kept kind of working on it. Different people, you know, our agents or other people we work with were like, there's more here. You guys can do more work. There's, there's more characters. There's more story here. You got to dig deeper and pull more out. And so that's kind of where it came from. Like, this was really something that started as sort of a lark in one way. And then we started taking it more seriously, too. And I think you see that in the book, that it really kind of goes to some brutal places and some dark places and kind of interrogates some things about, you know, trying to be, you know, whatever a man is supposed to be or your responsibility as a father, all those things kind of get interrogated. But it really just started as a story and started as sort of like, well, it would be a fun thing we could do. Um, and so to see it become the handyman method now, now is really incredible. But I mean, it often starts with just finding someone whose work resonates with yours. And I think that's something that we found. So That's amazing. Well, and I love how it's a haunted house book, like at the very basic level, but it's also about like algorithmic horror and it's got like found footagey elements. And I'm a huge found footage head. So I was really excited just reading the description of like YouTube videos being involved in this and having that be like a way that whatever is here is communicating with the outside world. And so I wanted to hear more about how that develops and that kind of technological aspect became such an integral part to this haunted house story. Nick slash Craig. Yeah. Okay, sure. Um, I you know I I will I will say, you know first of all that um different parts of this book came from you know when it's a collaboration they come from different places but but the, yeah. the initial story that I had gone to Andrew with I in the interceding year that we you know sort of tabled it I decided I didn't like that idea so that Andrew was like oh I oh. love this idea about this malignant handyman who reaches out via YouTube and sort of drives this guy insane out at this, you know, housing development. So that was kind of the kernel of the idea and that that's, that's Andrew's. So in some ways he's best to probably speak to that. Okay. Um, to me, I can say that, you know, briefly before I hand it over to Andrew is like, you know, having, having a son, um, you know, about the same age that Milo is in the, in the, in the book, oh. um, you know, you can see the, omnipresence of YouTube, YouTube shorts, 
the kind of um, ca characters, they're not characters, they're, you know, they're personalities, you know, you YouTube, um, you know, people who, you know, have a huge influence on that generation, and certainly on ours, too, we certainly decided to focus on sort of the, you know, emasculation that I think some men feel by just not be, as you said, it's a haunted house story, and at some level, you're supposed to feel safe in your house, but when your house starts to fall apart around you, you know, do you have the competencies to actually sort of like handle that? And a lot of people of my generation lack that, you know, uh, we haven't really been brought up that way to, to some degree, even my, my own father, you know, we'd have to go back to my grandfather to find someone who really could fix their own house. So those yeah. skills have kind of been eroding in, in a lot of men over time. And thank God there's, you know, there's YouTube, but, um, yeah, Andrew, I don't know you, you again, as it's your idea, you're probably best to comment on that. Well, I think it it kind of came from part of what it eventually became, and I think you saw this, Mary Beth, with like the was just how quickly you can just be trying to find a single video, and then seven videos later, you're like, why is why am I getting white supremacist content? Why am I getting why like, am I like in flat Earth YouTube? Like, yeah, how yeah, did I yeah. end up on QAnon YouTube? Yeah, like, yeah. Where and did you didn't this start there at all. Like, you weren't even <laughs> looking for Warhammer videos. You were looking for like. <laughs> how do i fix my sink or like yeah. is this yeah. you know a photo of you know a wire hanging loose being like is this bad oh yes like <laughs> it really it really what disconcerting to me and then also seeing that with kids as well how much bullshit remixed content was out there like elsa spider-man party time it's WT. Crazy. my cousins are little and they have like i they're youtube kids and i'm like this is like surrealist horror that you're watching like what is this crap that you're watching on yeah. your ipad it's so weird yeah and, and it's so, so that short was... too like the youtube shorts it's just like i i hear you know nick watching them and it's just thir 13 second bumps of this to this to this with no narrative it's not meant to have a narrative so as you said mary beth and andrew it, it's it's kind of for, for my sensibilities as a you know a guy in his mid 40s is like holy you know, it, it's scary. It actually is in its own way scary. And I assume the same way that maybe our own parents looked at some of the stuff we were into, but I I, I don't think it's the same. I don't think it's the same. Yeah. yeah. No, there's something that like, I think there's something really disconcerting about like, we don't actually know. This is where the algorithmic thing comes from. It's like, we don't actually know. And the people who made it don't even actually know necessarily how these things are happening. It's being processed. It's being diverted it's like oh yeah well we set it up but it runs on its own and so i think you know that sort of inhuman aspect of it is what's terrifying or what's scary and then if someone were to use that for their own intentions so that's kind of where that was coming from i mean i was also influenced by stuff like you know um the unedited footage of a bear from like adult swim the sort of I read that in the acknowledgments and I was so excited that I saw that. I was like, okay, so we are on a similar wavelength of like yeah. where this is coming from in terms of like absurdist, like almost found footage, but like trying to be real, but yeah. Oh. Yeah, exactly. So, so, but a lot of those elements only came in like later too. Like we kind of look back and be like, where's this coming from? And obviously like the haunted house stuff is there, but I think for the internet stuff, it is very much um, getting too comfortable getting too safe with really parasocial relationships yeah. that don't exist, right? Like people who believe they know a YouTube personality or a podcast personality or something and that they're their friends, you know, friend of the pod kind of stuff. And then, you know, that's got to be someone's horror title in a couple of years or already friend of the pod. But I do think in the case of this, it was almost like, okay, let's invert that. Like what happens when the YouTube personality is parasocial to you um, and and is coming for you individually. And I think that kind of flip was where Handyman Hank, our character kind of comes from. And I mean, we were able to play a lot with that and have fun with it, but it really was rooted in those like modern concerns that uh, like Craig said, you know, existed in different forms before. And I think you see that with Handyman, you know, like there, but yeah. uh, it's been accelerated. And we're well, like that acceleration of content. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, 
I get, I might cut this if it's a spoiler, but there's a point where we learn about like Candyman Hank and how he has evolved. And I love how you deal with like who he was in a certain form for earlier things. I'm trying to talk so vaguely around everything yeah. here, but it's cool. Like you even have that evolution of that figure, which is awesome, amazing, especially with the parasocial relationships. And I also think that ties in so well with how you're tackling toxic masculinity and intergenerational, like passing that down to your kids with him, with, Trent forming almost also his own weird relationship with Hank and seeing him as this figure and we like mentioned white supremacy and how people think that these white supremacist YouTube content makers like have their best interests and I wanted to hear more about talk like tackling toxic masculinity it's such a you know it's such a huge topic now especially in the age of the internet with the way the internet has really made it incels and everything and you tackle that in such a unique way with this book and look at it with both Milo and with more with Trent, but with Milo too, the young son. And I wanted to hear more about writing about that and then what that was like for the both of you to kind of interrogate that toxic masculinity while you're writing these characters, especially Trent. I'm not hmm, sure who the best a good, one is. No, that's a, it's that a great to question. It's kind yeah. of a, I wouldn't say it's a, a, a minefield because we wouldn't have written about it if we were, you know, concerned about how to, but you know, there's nuances with it that you want to sort of be careful how you're kind of, my sense of it is, is that, um, you know, and I obviously I have no sociological background. I'm, I'm not a sociologist. Most of my stuff is anecdotal. It's looking out the a yeah. window and seeing how my neighbors are behaving or within my friendship networks, um, just sort of how I s sort of, and that, that becomes in, informed opinion for me. And one thing that I noticed, and I don't know if, the, I think this is a manifestation absolutely of toxic masculinity, but maybe Mary Beth, you know, I'm not sure. Yeah, but just like guys have a really difficult time of my generation. I think generations to come having a really difficult time dealing with the excellence of their if they're in a heter, heter you know heterosexual relationship with their with their wives or partners being really successful. You know because that just mm -hmm. wasn't the way it was necessarily. Like women from my mom's generation, my grandmother's generation, you know the the deck was stacked against them essentially and at some point women said you know fuck this uh this is not the way this should work and the men especially men who were boys growing up watching those relationships came whether meaningfully or purposefully or not to expect that same kind of march of consistency in their own lives and yeah. when they don't get it and in some ways like some of the people i know bless them haven't really put in the legwork or the effort sometimes to like, you know, I think there's a sense that it should be granted to them or should be given to them. And when it's not, it turns into hostility, it turns into anger, and it finds its outlet often in the person who is actually sustaining the relationship on a lot of meaningful levels, financial and otherwise, that being the wife, the girlfriend, the partner. So, you know, and then it, then it sometimes turns even more toxic into becoming like, if this person hadn't walked into my life, my life would be so much better or even worse. This person is trying to sort of like strangle me in a weird way. Yeah. And even though that's an absurd assumption, that's an absurd way to look at your life sort of for the prep, for the purpose of the book, it was sort of like, well, well, what, what if, what if your wife was trying to not murder you, but she had, she had ulterior motives, you know, the things that, that, simple-minded men seem to think is happening to them with, with no actual background and really they're just not willing to self-scrutinize themselves as to why they've gotten themselves in that potential position so to me that was what what i what i was looking at for a lot of it was this this sense that that men just cannot deal with and are having a very difficult time dealing with generationally um the success um and the excellence of their their spouse yeah. That's awesome. Well, not awesome, but I just, I like how it like manifests in this novel for sure. Oh, and then Andrew, did you want to speak to that as well? Yeah. Oh, I would just think like something that kind of Craig and I've talked about, like building on what he's saying, uh, is that it also sort of leads a lot of people. It It's, it ends up being self-destructive. And I think that's the, like, it's a destructive impulse. It's a, it's a ruination of the self. Um, where you know like like toxicity almost becomes like that fades away and it just becomes like a lonely brutal existence in a way 
um, and you see this with people who've been isolated through, from their families through QAnon and through other things, is that the, the deeper you go, it's almost like you lose any relational ability like to yeah. outside of yourself. Yeah. And I think that was something we really ended up playing with quite a bit too towards the end. Uh, not spoiling, but like yeah. the the fact that, you know, what happens is you end up so lost in your own sort of ideology that you end up, you know, deep in a pit where no one can reach you. Yeah. And I think that was something that we ended up playing with quite a bit just because uh, it starts out helpful. Uh, it starts out as something where it's like, oh, I'm going to change my life. Uh, but, you know, change is weighted with a lot. Change is not always a good thing. And so, you know, you're going to change your life. Does that mean you're going to, you know, destroy yourself in the process? And I think yeah. that's kind of what we were into with this book. Yeah. 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 And also, I should say, we had a great time. It was one of the most enjoyable, fun <laughs> books I've ever written. Because Really? Yeah. Like, well, I mean, outside of some of the brutal stuff that you've read, Mary Beth, I mean, that was frankly for me. I, I like writing that type of stuff. If, if no, really, if I had, had no stuff, idea. <laughs> right, yeah, I, but but also like when you take, you know, manhood, whatever you want to call that, to its furthest, illogical, ridiculous, sort of satirical, scabrous end, it does enter a kind of realm of of gallows humor, really. Um, and it was enjoyable to sort of write those aspects where. Trent was so dedicated in in all these ridiculous trappings of how to how to shore up his manhood that he felt was being assaulted on all sides that that it what those scenes were a lot of a lot of fun to write in 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 ways that you know randomly come to me in the cutter books but not too often so yeah um so yeah it was actually it was a it was a you know it was a difficult book to write in some ways but it was a lot of fun in others cool. well and I mean you talk about some of the more brutal parts. So I wanted to hear about how y'all collaborate on those. And it's, there's a particularly two parts involving one, a turtle, and then one involving a man. And I was just curious how, those two were the ones that really stood out to me about how you handled writing those scenes. Like, did one of you start and then the other one would read and add more? Like, what was that process in really adding these brutal moments um, throughout the novel? I would say that Andrew just left those to me. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> hell handled, yeah. Cool. He handled okay. some of the more right. cerebral right. aspects of the book. Uh, that was sort of like considered to be my wheelhouse, I think. And and they, I mean, I came up with those, you know, and I, I know some people who are, um, have reticence about reading the Cutter books for certain reasons, you know, well-founded reasons, you know, are going to have, have issues, maybe not so much with the man, but with the turtle. Um, so yeah, no, those were, those were entirely on me and uh, I take full, uh, responsibility for those Thank as you. well. Thank you so much for making me feel nauseous. Um, I really appreciate that. I never feel nauseous watching horror movies, but I always feel nauseous reading. So thank you so much. I appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, I will say I, uh, like we both also edited this book together and like went through it all together. So there was nothing like everything that is in there. We've both sort of committed yeah. to at this point. Yeah. And yeah. to me, like I've been reading Craig so long that like, honestly, when people, when I'm seeing reviews, they're like, whoa, this is, I was like, oh, really? I thought like he kind of tapped the brakes a tiny bit. Like, <laughs> I mean, like definitely, I will say definitely a little yeah. bit. I was expecting yeah. even more, but yeah. that's not a bad thing. It just, I love, but I also love how like, it feels like it just happens. Like yeah. this book, you guys don't have like a, it's like a, a sudden. And I love how sudden a lot of the horror is in this. And it just feels so matter of fact. And it is, makes it all the more jarring and like, wait, hold on, where am I? And I think that adds to the kind of vibe of reading this book and just being in this like weird nightmarish fever dream state that this oh. book made me feel. That's great. We're glad because it is, it's a fusion really of both of our aesthetics. And I think that really, it took some navigation, but I think we really did our best. And and as Andrew said, like I would never put anything in there that he wouldn't co-sign to or vice versa. Yeah. Um, so yeah. it's good you mentioned that, Andrew. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like everything, like when I'm reading, you know, Nick Cutter, sicko mode shit, I'm like, yep, yeah, this is what I know. This is what I'm comfortable with. And, you know, like, and Craig's right there too. Yeah, where my, some of my parts might be like, 
all right, it's this YouTube video thing. We got this and this and this. But we're not going to explain it more than that. And it's like, what? It's like, no. Nope, I love that. But I love that, though. Gonna... It's like, in reading this, I was like, I don't understand how this is two people. Because it felt... Yeah. It, and I love because I was that's why I was so excited to talk to you guys because it feels like such a melding of both of your sensibilities of cerebral weird like cosmic horror-y stuff but also incredibly grounded body horror so it was really cool to read this melding of the two of you like it's such an it's so it's like accomplishment it feels like to be able to do that's, that yeah all the all the all if it feels if it feels that way you know, if you were there with us through the writing process, you would have seen the the grittiness of it, of of making it happen. Jeez, sorry. No. Um, yeah. 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 Um, but 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 I but I I agree. I think it worked out really well, and we had a really good editor, um, you know, and had eyes on it throughout. And uh, you know, yeah, exactly. It was it was a real like enjoyable process. And I don't think me and Andrew have both co-written before, like on uh, some screenplays and and things, but. Um, this has felt like the most, um, as you said, Mary Beth, like, like the most, a melding that actually is expressive of both of our aesthetics that actually it, it coheres and it, and it works. That's awesome. Yeah. And I, and I feel like part of that too, is like, even from the early stages, it was not very, like we, we weren't secretively doing things like, yeah. like it yeah. was very, you, like, yeah especially early it was like hey man I wrote a thousand more words here you go and then it was like oh, okay I'm gonna write a thousand more words and then it just evolved and evolved and then later yeah it was like okay you gotta edit these scenes I gotta edit these scenes because there's no way we're gonna finish this but the creation process was incredibly um like organic that way like it was not um we didn't have silos and we didn't have necessarily um like places where we weren't supposed to go so if I thought something okay. was gonna work like I would do it and then we would discuss we'd be like well I didn't really I don't think that's going where we, we need it to go but there were never like places where it was like oh you're not allowed to touch that character that's my guy okay. like it was yeah. very um collaborative from the jump and like from the like the first you know five pages like was very involved and I think that's what you see too is like we actually have been working on this so long that yeah you do forget sometimes outside of like full out sicko mode cutter like what you maybe wrote for a specific sentence and you're like mm -hmm. okay like yeah it has been gone through so many iterations so and yeah. you know again we're friends and we remain friends which is important yes. you know but I mean you, you kind of you don't want to put the friendship honestly I mean that sincerely I don't I wouldn't yeah. put it friendship meaningful friendship that I have um at risk for for the sake of a book or anything like that and you know we had a great time I went over to Andrew's house and uh we had a sleepover had a pillow Aww. fight Aww. You <laughs> watch watch movies. Too. we really oh cute you watch movies we together yeah we watch Aww. movies together we, we talked about toxic masculinity and uh <laughs> Yeah, but we, we like we would have like in-person meetings you know every yeah. few months just to be like how do we feel about this because you know we both have our own things Craig is always working on like seven books at a time um you know and you know he's you know raising a family and I'm working like a full-time day gig and we're both just trying to balance everything um, and so making time for this project and, you know, being like, okay, the two of us, six hours sitting, talking, yeah. you know, we're going to work through a lot of stuff. And so having that was important. I think, you know, we obviously are doing most of our writing on computers. We're online. We're in yeah. documents. We're like, what, what is this guy doing? Why is he moving this paragraph? What's happening? But <laughs> uh, in the end, like, having those human moments and having those moments of like hey we just wrote a bunch of really fucked up shit are we good <laughs> like are we good to keep going mm -hmm. um it's good to have those personal check-ins and have that sort of relationship and also like just the you know Craig somebody who works extremely hard all the time and that for me that was like okay I have to meet him there and I think that's a big part of collaboration too, is like, you have to both want it the same way. I think you have, like, you both have to kind of agree to get it done yeah, because yeah. at the end of the day, like 
people will start having deadlines for you that you have to meet and that you have to take seriously. And when you can rely on each other and know that the other guy is going to drop one of his seven other projects to make sure this gets done. Yeah. Uh, that's really important. Yeah. Yeah. No. And, and Andrew's being disingenuous a little bit, like he's got a ton of energy and we matched energy really well. And I, I felt he lifted me up uh, many times when, when I needed it. So um, yeah, it was, it was great. I know, I know this feels like a love fest, but it is, it's, it's, it's I good. love it though. That's you know? what I want. Yeah. I would rather yeah. be a love fest and like, this is the worst process of my life. <laughs> no, I mean, that's what's fun is that it was like yeah. really cool. And even like our epigraphs, like Greg hunted oh, those yeah. guys down and we got what we wanted and we got like the book we wanted. Like, that's, what's cool in the end is like, it ended up being something that really is ours in a way, like, yeah, which I didn't know I would feel, but now that it exists pretty much, I'm like, oh, wow, like this thing is a real object and like a real sort of piece of work that we both kind of, uh, like it's done now. Yeah. <laughs> And, you know what I mean though like it, it yeah I do. And it came out so much you know so much stronger than I think with what we started with where it yeah, was just now there's like just that nervous period of of which with any book I mean Andrew just had one come out not too long ago but yeah oh I can't wait to read the Mary Gold I'm so excited yes, I haven't read it yet awesome. but I'm so excited to read the Mary Gold awesome yeah. awesome yeah hope you happy to happy to chat some time about that but um yeah it's out there um and yeah it's been cool to see that happen and then now, you know, this one's just far enough away where it's like, okay, now we do, now we do the fall season. Now we do. Right. Yeah. We, we jumped down into that uh, rabbit hole again, but I mean, I, yeah, yeah. It's, it's that nervous making feeling of like, anytime you've got a, a piece of um, work out there that you, you know, you sign your name to and you're, you're, I mean, I think for me and Andrew both after this much time, like, you know, you just, it's not that it's not that you're not nervous every time. I think you're nervous, but but at the same point, it's more. I think it's more important as time goes on to just try and say the things you want to say. You know, you're not trying to be yeah. hurtful to anybody or 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 be purposely provocative, um, and and yet within that, try and express the thing that you're. You know, the thematic concern. You know, try and unearth that and and work your way through it to some kind of conclusion that feels earned. Um, yeah. But then you're like, well, you know, that's 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 our attempt. You know, and that now yeah. it becomes um, whoever reads it, their their impression of what they take away from it, which is always interesting and sometimes a little bracing to discover. Yeah. Oh, I can imagine. Goodreads people are, I'm I'm getting, I'm new in the world of book talk and Goodreads. So it's very interesting to see that world of l literary criticism. Um, it's fascinating. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I you know, <laughs> to I, say I, the least. I'm best avoiding it. I feel like Andrew actually, yeah, Andrew sort of goes there. I'm like, you know, I, I avoid that um, Fair. more often. I, I recommend, a, yeah, it's for readers. Like that's yeah. It's yeah. for readers and it is, and that's what it's for. Um, And I think like if you're, as the writer, you just have to focus on the books yeah. and the writing. And uh, yeah, like my, my wife's a writer too. And she just will not go. She will, she's never looked. Never. I always say that though. Don't read the comments. Like it's like yeah, my yeah, yeah, policy exactly. as Same a journalist. I'm like, don't yeah. read the comments. Like yeah, I don't, don't need read to the know. comments. That's fine. Yeah. Just stay ignorant yeah. on that one. <laughs> yeah, it's a great. You're right. Ignorance really is bliss in a lot of ways. So. <laughs> well, this has been so awesome chatting with the both of you. I do want to read a very tiny quote to wrap up, just to give everyone a little taste of my favorite quote from this book. Um, it's very short and it's not spoilery. I promise. Um. Mm. Those weeks passed in a state of domestic ecstasy. Why would that be? When prey dies in fear, hunters will say the meat tastes bitter. What of happiness then? May we speak of the taste of joyful meat. So everyone, Handyman Method comes to the books to bookstores August 8th. So please check this out. And thank you guys again for chatting with me. Thanks so much for having us.